On the ancient Mediterranean island of Crete, there lived a people, fantastic, fascinating, fabulous, frivolous, fearsome, decadent, and determined. They were the Minoans. They were the first true masters of the sea in human history, and they exploited their superior abilities to control those around them. They have often been called the first European civilization. Their unique and elaborate society ended in a cycle of catastrophe, foreign domination, and destruction. The island of Crete is located in the eastern Mediterranean, at the nexus of ancient maritime trade routes linking Europe, Western Asia, and North Africa together. The strategic position of the island and its ample natural resources set up Crete for a remarkable history. Minoan history can be divided into four periods. The Pre-Palatial Period, the Proto-Palatial Period, the Neo-Palatial Period, and the Post-Palatial Period. During the Pre-Palatial Period, the Minoan civilization slowly emerged, mastering farming and seafaring technologies. The Proto-Palatial Period saw the Minoans develop international trade routes and a booming economy centered around massive palace administrative complexes. The Neo-Palatial Period was the height of Minoan power and prosperity. This gave way to a more turbulent age where invaders from the mainland dominated Crete and the island's influence, power, and prosperity collapsed. Long before Minoan society developed in humanity's prehistoric past, many of the early inhabitants of Crete most likely arrived there by accident. Primitive fishing boats, rafts, and wreckage, carried out to sea by the tide or by storms, stumbled into Crete. The watercraft carried fishermen, fugitives, marooned adventurers, and migrants from around the mainland of the eastern Mediterranean. They decided to stay. The island remained sparsely populated by hunter-gatherers and coastal fishermen until around 7000 BC, when farming was introduced, possibly by migrant Anatolian farmers. The population steadily increased, and by the mid to later 4th millennium BC, several other important technologies were adopted, like the potter's wheel and metalworking, which drastically increased productivity and efficiency. Domesticated cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs were also introduced. Cattle were especially valued, as they were used to plow fields. They also provided nutritious sources of protein, like meat, milk, and cheese. Other animal byproducts like textiles and leather fueled early Minoan industry and trade. Initially, the proto-Minoans leveled up their seafaring experience by sailing along the coast of their own island, as it was easier to trade goods with other coastal settlements by boat than to trek through the mountainous terrain of the 150-mile-long island. Throughout Minoan history, the vast majority of the island's population was concentrated on the eastern half of the island, as it had the best farmland. Crete was self-sufficient. It had plenty of food sources, fresh water, and timber to build boats. All basic necessities needed for a great seafaring civilization. But there was something missing on their island. Metal. Specifically copper and tin needed to make bronze. Metals were the crude oil of the ancient world needed to fuel a civilization's construction, military, and agricultural productivity. After mastering the basics of seafaring and making improvements to their boats, Minoan merchants began trading with the Cycladic Islands to their north, and then began exploring and trading with the other peoples of the Aegean. The Minoans on Crete and the inhabitants of the Cyclades Islands formed close cultural and economic ties that were to last for more than a thousand years. Around the beginning of the second millennium BC, the economy on Crete was booming. Larger and larger homes were being built for an emerging ruling class of merchants, priests, and nobles. These homes, along with warehouses and workshops, began to merge into larger palace complexes. This was the first palace period on Crete, during which the Minoans began to flex their muscle, occupying the Cyclades Islands, and establishing ever further trade routes. The Minoans began regular trade with the island of Cyprus, where they acquired large amounts of copper. They also established regular trade with the Amorite kingdoms and Canaanite city-states of the Levant. The Kingdom of Egypt became the Minoan's most lucrative trading partner. There they acquired vast amounts of gold, which could be traded at much higher prices elsewhere in the Mediterranean. 
The Minoans also became skilled metalworkers and could trade finished gold items at an even higher price for a greater profit margin. The vast amount of resources the Minoans accumulated necessitated that they develop a written script to help keep track of it all, who owned what, record contracts, and possibly record important events. First, the Minoans developed a unique hieroglyphic script, possibly inspired by their contact with the ancient Egyptians. This was gradually replaced by a more functional-looking script, creatively called by historians, Linear A. Unfortunately, neither of these scripts have ever been deciphered. Well, at least for now. Maybe one day, one of you will decipher it, and we can learn much more details about Minoan economy, history, politics, and religion. In the late 18th century BC, a massive series of earthquakes appears to have rocked the island, destroying at least four of the island's most important palace complexes and much of the surrounding cities and towns. This destruction and death might have been enough to cause the downfall of a less robust civilization, but in fact, it seems to have had the opposite effect and strengthened the Minoan's resolve. All the palace complexes and destroyed buildings were quickly rebuilt on a colossal scale. The largest palace at Knossos covered six acres and had more than 1,000 rooms, approximately 1,300. Some areas of the luxurious palace were up to five stories tall, and the complex boasted a theater, many large warehouses, and workshops. It also had an advanced system of indoor plumbing. The town around Knossos grew into a massive city with a population that may have been as high as 100,000 people. Based on the archaeological record, it is the generally accepted scholarly consensus that throughout the Neopalatial period, Knossos was the dominant, if not absolute, power center on Crete, with other palace centers, towns, and rural villas all owing allegiance to Knossos. It is a subject of scholarly debate if Knossos dominated the other palace centers before the Neopalatial period. In fact, there is very little known about the Minoan form of government from any time period, and how the relations were between the different palace complexes. One piece of evidence that indicates that the Minoans were internally united is that there is currently no evidence for war between the different Minoan centers. From much later classical Greek legend, folklore, and histories, it is asserted that a king named Minos ruled from Knossos. He established an empire in the Aegean, founded colonies, and stamped out piracy. In regard to the Minoans, the Greek historian Herodotus used the term Thelesocracy to describe this type of seafaring empire. In recent times, it has been hypothesized that Minos was a Minoan word for king, or perhaps a title like Caesar, where later kings took the name of an early great king. Other scholars have hypothesized that the Minoans did not even have a king, but instead were ruled over by priestess queens. At Knossos there is a throne room. However, in the significant amount of Minoan art found throughout Crete, there is no clear example of a kingly figure depicted. In contrast, there are numerous examples of prominent females depicted that have been interpreted as goddesses, priestesses, or perhaps even queens. Whatever the case may be, from surviving art it appears women did play a dominant role in religion and palace life. In contrast to other Near Eastern cultures, where men are depicted far more often than women. In Minoan art it is the opposite, women are more common, and dress far more elaborately than the fellas. Men are usually shown performing outdoor manual labor, or as soldier sailors. This probably led to the artistic convention of portraying men as heavily tanned, and most women as pale white as it was probably a status symbol to have noble women spending away their hours indoors. The vitamin D deficient look became so desirable that applying toxic white lead makeup became a thing. This same artistic convention is also seen in early Roman fresco. But palatial life was not all toxic beauty and ostentatious dresses. While the men were away, the women played politics and managed the economy. This evolves naturally in societies where males are indisposed for long periods of time. Like in the much later Spartan society, where the warrior elite lived in all-male communes training for war and broing it out, while their wives engaged in business and managed the economy. On Crete, many merchant and warrior sailors were gone from the island at any given time, and many also drowned at sea, so the island would have had a disproportionate amount of women. The returning merchant sailors evidently adorned their wives with every manner of luxury and every lavish fabric from far-off lands. Some early scholars assume the Minoans were a peaceful, unwarlike people because their cities had no walls, and the near absence of warfare in their art, the relatively small number of their weapons that had been unearthed. On the first point, their cities, towns, and palaces did not need walls. They had wooden walls. 
Their navy patrolled the Aegean, and they were confident in their superior nautical abilities and intimate knowledge of the waters surrounding Crete. Their merchants and spies likely knew of any major potential threat before their enemies had even finished building their fleet. The Minoans rarely portrayed military in their art, probably because they rarely engaged in conflict. The threat of bringing overwhelming force to any point in the Aegean was probably enough to cause a troublesome city to offer tribute, realizing that any resistance would be futile. The Mycenaeans of mainland Greece emerged in the 18th century BC as a vassal or tributary of the Minoans. For over a century, the Minoans were at the height of their power. No nearby kingdom or people posed any real threat. Then, the important Minoan trading center and colony of Thera exploded. It was one of the most powerful volcanic eruptions in human history. The force of the eruption triggered massive tsunamis that devastated the northern coastline of Crete. It is probable that the immense tidal waves sank much of the Minoan fleet. The determined Minoans had experienced devastating natural disasters before, but none like this. Despite the massive setbacks, they began to slowly rebuild. It was during this time that the Mycenaean states of the mainland began to build up their own fleets, which they used to take the Minoan islands one by one. It might have been a fair fight, leading to a long drawn-out war between the two civilizations. But then, disaster struck again, earthquakes rocked Crete, Many died, and the partially rebuilt ruins became ruins again. The depopulated Minoans began to rebuild again, but were undoubtedly demoralized. Sometime around 1450 BC, the mainland Mycenaeans arrived and conquered the island. A new Mycenaean ruling class set up shop at Knossos, where they built a new palace. Throughout the remainder of the post-palatial period, Minoan culture was gradually replaced by Mycenaean. A level of prosperity did return to the island but it was a pale shadow of its former monopolistic opulence. The Mycenaean states were on the periphery of the interconnected system of great empires of the later Bronze Age. In contrast to the relatively united empires of the East, the Mycenaeans were a very loose confederation of states centered around fortified palace complexes. It is likely that their squabbling and rivalries made them vulnerable when in the late 13th century BC, pirates and internal rebellion overwhelmed the Mycenaeans. On Crete, the palaces and towns were destroyed. Again. Some survivors built remote fortified hilltop settlements, which are evidence of the turbulent times. It also appears that many throughout the Aegean and coastal Anatolia joined the marauders. They moved east along the coast, leaving a swath of destruction in their wake. Their rampage culminated with a failed invasion of Egypt. Some of the captured people of the sea, called the Palisette, were resettled in southern Canaan. Their descendants became known as the Philistines. Scholars generally agree that the Peleset were of Aegean origin, and the most popular theory is that they were descended from the amalgamated Minoans and Mycenaeans of Crete, which if you would like to know more about the Philistines, check out the video I made about them. As the whole greater Near East fell into a dark age, Crete became a sparsely populated backwater, and memory of its once glorious past faded into myth and legend, and much of it was forgotten. 3,000 years after Minoan civilization collapsed, they were rediscovered. The first archaeologist to undertake excavations at Knossos was named Minos. How cool is that? Very cool. This has been Epimetheus. A huge thanks to my patrons over on Patreon. And to all of you who enjoyed the video enough to watch till the end.